Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you had great lunch. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited uh, to talk about navigating different strategies uh, for debugging WebAssembly. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, so a quick introduction about us. My name is Ashwin Kumar Uppala and I'm a program manager at GitHub. I'm Shwai. I'm a developer relations engineer at Millisearch. Uh, super excited to be back here. Uh, the last time I spoke at Cloud Native uh, Wasm Day was actually in 2021 virtually uh, when we just kind of opened up after COVID. So it's good to be back and present in finally in person as well. Awesome. So uh, the Cloud Native Wasm is growing. It's going very fast. In fact, my first experience with the WebAssembly was just one year ago um, at Open Source Summit and KubeCon. And since then, the proposals have been increasing very fast. And it is so cool to see how many awesome proposals we have so far. In fact, uh, recently, we had the Wasm garbage collection made available in Chrome for adoption, which is very good news. Uh, but I was curious while I was trying to explore more into WebAssembly and in one of the talks that I gave a few months ago in CU Navigate about the accessibility for WebAssembly in the communities that we have is how do I debug WebAssembly? Like if I'm trying to learn as a beginner or someone who has made a transition into WebAssembly or someone who just want to give it a try, how do I make sure that I'm doing it right? So what about the debugging? Do we have enough post proposals uh, so far? Uh, in WebAssembly space for debugging? Well, it's a bit challenging right now. Uh, there isn't a standardized WASM proposal for debugging uh, WebAssembly yet. This means uh, every WebAssembly runtime or the product or the application that we use or that you try to use uses a different set of approach towards debugging. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Shiva, do you want to give us a few sure. examples in detail? Yeah, so as part of present, like kind of preparing for this presentation, uh, so I'm a long time Wasm Edge com contributor and I've not really contributed much to Wasmer or to Was0 yet, but uh, I wanted to reach out to the maintainers of all of these different WebAssembly runtimes that are there and just kind of understand like what kind of approach are they kind of proposing towards uh, debugging because as kind of Ashwin mentioned that since there's no standardized way of approaching towards debugging, something like WASENN which is a standardized approach for, uh, for machine learning and neural networks in WebAssembly. Uh, so I reached out to the different founders and the maintainers of these uh, different WebAssembly runtimes. So it was more, uh, of course, right, the focus right now is a very uh, well-known WebAssembly runtime that can uh, allow your WebAssembly to run on edge, on server-side, on cloud native. Uh, so they don't really have any specific way or approach that they are following right now. Uh, so it's kind of a black box for that particular uh, WebAssembly runtime. Then I also had a word with one of the maintainers for Wasm Edge, and this is one of the approaches that I have personally also tried to use. Is um, so of course like Wasm Edge and the maintainers primarily are approaching this towards uh, two different ways. And these are again not some uh, really unique manners, but of course some of the common techniques that people are using right now in order to debug WebAssembly. So the first one is uh, the head of compilation. So in this case, uh, you're using your AOT compiler, and uh, of course there might be some issues that might prop up in your AOT compiler. Uh, so of course in this case, what you might want to do is instrument some code, or perhaps just change some of your original code to try to find the original issue. Um, so, of course, when you're using your area of time compilation, uh, you'll be generating your assembly uh, bytecode, and then, of course, you can try to debug that ASM that's generated from uh, your uh, compiler. Uh, another approach is, of course, uh, just trying to use a very native way of trying to identify what is that particular piece of your code that actually might be causing that issue. So if you're having, like, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the idea really is to be able to pinpoint or boil down to that specific piece of your code logic that, uh, of course, once you're converting your source code into the WebAssembly module, um, is to identify that particular source code uh, within you know, your entire source directory uh, that might be causing that particular issue. But of course, this is kind of a hide and seek where you're trying to uh, put in a lot of effort in trying to identify that very exact issue and it can be very time consuming. But of course, like both of these approaches, one of the biggest downsides is that if you're not aware of the WebAssembly execution model and how uh, stack tracing all of this works, uh, then it might be very difficult for someone from a non-WASM background to actually try to debug WebAssembly modules if you're not aware of these approaches. 
Then of course, uh, Wasm Time, which is one of the most uh, mature WebAssembly runtimes out there, actually does a pretty good job when trying to use your standard debuggers like uh, GDB or your LLDB uh, in order to basically be able to find issues within both your guest functions and your hosts as well. So Wasm hosts by taking a look essentially at a step-by-step -step approach of looking at how the Wasm uh, host and your guest basically works. Um, and then, of course, we have var0, which is one of the newest or newer WebAssembly runtimes that based on Go. So since it's completely based on Go, you can very easily use the strong debugging capability that you get within your Go functions and try to also then, again, point out where exactly uh, the issue might be inside of your WebAssemblies. So, of course, like in, in this particular approach, you're really looking at the standard source code debugging where you're trying to identify the issues within the source code rather than directly in the WebAssembly module itself. But, of course, uh, Vazir also comes with support for Dwarf. Um, not fully sub supported yet, but, of course, there is uh, support. And, of course, um, other is that you can use some operators uh, that can get you some telemetry data. And we'll be, of course, uh, looking at some of these approaches uh, as we proceed in the presentation. Wow, that's a lot of options, Shivai. Uh, it's, it's, it can be a bit overwhelming when you have so many choices for so many different runtimes to debug them. Uh, let's, let's categorize them. Let's make it a bit more simpler on the ways to debug WebAssembly. Uh, in general, when you are learning a language or any other uh, framework or in general, the standard debugging style is the print line debugging where you just uh, work directly with your source code or you can also have unit tests. Uh, that also works just fine. Uh, then we got standard debugging like LLDB or G GNU uh, debugger for if you want to get more into the low level uh, debugging tools. And I'm going to be explaining a bit more about browser dev tools, which should be the most accessible for all of us to use that uh, when working with Wasm projects. And after that, uh, we'll try to give you a demo of some of the debugging applications, if not all. A uh, couple of them are like Mod Server, Observe Apps SDK, and uh, Wobbert, which stands for Wasm Binary. Uh, now, these are applications just support, which are supposed to be easy to use and should help you debug very specific uh, Wasm applications. Uh, now, to give you a more dynamic uh, demo on the mod server and these debugging applications, uh, before that, let's go and try. Uh, so, of course, like yeah. what we're seeing right now is uh, even with the different runtime approaches, you saw that we kind of collect, collected all the different approaches that the different runtimes and the maintainers are usually following. And this also does not just apply to the runtimes, but also to actual uh, you know, companies where they're adopting WebAssembly. So it's whether the WebAssembly first companies or companies that are adopting WebAssembly. So these are some of the approaches, right? Uh, so one of the things that we like to kind of also focus on um, is primarily focused with how something like Wasm Time is able to use LEDB and something like, let's say, uh, Warmer, which is another WebAssembly runtime, uh, actually does provide a very comprehensive way of being able to uh, do debugging. And of course, uh, I'll recommend everyone to uh, check out the GitHub repository as well for Warmer. It, I think it's actually inside the WebAssembly or in the bytecode alliance. Uh, so they have given a very good uh, brief of how you can actually debug, debug not just with the AOD style, but also with LEDB as well. Uh, and of course, uh, with Warmer, you also get support for Dwarf as well. So you can use Dwarf and we'll be talking a bit more about how to use Dwarf. Um, and of course, uh, outside of uh, Wasm, uh, like we just talk about Warmer, uh, we also have the Wasm time. For, for some reason, it did not load up mm -hmm. the, uh, so like, that's fine. But the idea with Wasm time, as I've also kind of covered before, is that you're using your typical LLDB uh, and it, again, like, to basically get your stack trace and uh, be able to get some debugging information. And you can just uh, look out on the official uh, Wasm time documentation that kind of talks more about how you can use the LDB to get information about both your WebAssembly host and also your guest functions. And kind of just do a step-by-step -step, uh, debugging of, of, of both of these. Now, before I jump into the browser debugging, let's a brief single slide uh, to give you a brief idea of the technologies that is used uh, for debuggers in the browser. Uh, the first solution that we use, that you see using is the Dwarf, which is used to uh, compile low-level languages like C and C++. Uh, but yes, we got a couple of problems there that not all compilers are supported by Dwarf. And the debug data sometimes can be big. 
which can be hard uh, to go through. Uh, we can solve that problem by using something called source maps. Uh, source map splits that uh, debug data using a debug file. Uh, it can be, it can make it easier uh, to read, but then the new challenge we have here is to put them back together uh, after we use the source map to decompile that code. Uh, so these are the two underlying technologies that we see uh, for debugging on the web. Uh, so let's, let's take a small sample here, a small example. Uh, this is a simple C program, which uh, kind of asserts if x is greater than or equal to y. If it's not, it should throw me an error. Now, first, what I'm going to do is I want to make sure this thing runs in my web. So to convert a C program into a WebAssembly format, um, we use mscripten. Uh, and after we have done that, uh, I want to go ahead and enable WebAssembly debugging tools in my dev tools of my browser. Any Chromium browser should work. It doesn't have to be Chrome if you're using Edge or any anything else. It should have the uh, it should have this under the experiment settings. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run this program. And once I've enabled the uh, WebAssembly uh, functions in my Chrome DevTools, you should be able to set breakpoints for your program. And uh, if once I like enable pause on caught exceptions, and if I just go ahead and take a closer look at the scope, what's happening here, I can see the parameters where the program goes wrong or throws an error. And if I look below at the call stack, I can see the function that is going on uh, incorrectly. Now, this is a very, very simple uh, sample of how I would try to debug applications on the web. Uh, so yeah, uh, moving on to dev tools. Yeah, so so far what you've seen is uh, we have looked at some of the standard approaches towards like print line debugging with your standard source functions or source code itself. Uh, then of course we have uh, the ability to use something like your standard debuggers with LLDB uh, to get more in-depth in information about your WASM modules. And then of course right now we'll also look at the approach. Uh, and of course like the approach covered by Ashwin was that one way is to just take your WASM module and just simply, like a simple old function, just run it in the browser and get some details with the help of Dwarf to get like uh, more details about the call, uh, call, uh, call trace and all of that. So other one that, of course, we're, we are seeing right now, and I, I'm not, uh, I'll kind of argue calling this as standard debugging, but more towards uh, tracing and uh, you know monitoring your WASM modules. So these approaches might not directly tell you that, hey, like this is the particular issue in your was a module, but they will all, but at least they will give you enough information on what are some of the key aspects that are probably missing from your was a module. So whether it's like certain imports or exports that are missing or certain check files that are uh, not, uh, you know, worth uh, pushing your uh, was a module into production. Because of course, what we don't want is, um, you know, a non-standard way of like compiling your was a module and then seeing that you know it just throws an error so really the techniques that we are kind of now going to cover about dev tools is uh, to monitor and trace uh, your or kind of instrument your was modules to ensure that we do not push uh, faulty was modules into production and of course one uh, like before we talk about these particular techniques uh, the the major point that we want to kind of highlight over here is that generally we are seeing these was modules as black boxes right so yes, we are able to get to know about the details about the input data, the output data, but we're not really concerned or, I mean, we have not been able to find very efficiently what is actually happening inside the WASM module itself. So you'll get all this data about uh, the input outputs and what type of WASI calls we are making, but what, is actually, uh, what exactly is happening? Because if you consider when we are basically taking our main source code and compiling it down into the WebAssembly binary, uh, most of the time we are losing a lot of information because the WASM binaries are very small in size. So we are losing a lot of information in this process and it's very hard to understand like uh, what is happening if you're not retaining that metadata. Um, and of course, like another issue that we kind of see with these kind of instrumentation techniques or these monitoring techniques um, is essentially when you are trying to generate these logs, you are also generating a lot of noise as well. So of course, like for example, if you were just having a simple was a module, you convert it into the VAT format. You, probably the VAT file might be 20, 30,000 lines of code. 
So it can be very hard to debug those directly if you are trying to, like, let's say, generate logs from our WASM module. So these approaches are, of course, not giving us the full picture of what's happening inside the WASM module. And then, of course, it generates a lot of uh, noise that essentially is not very good for if you want to do quick and efficient debugging. So that is why we'll now talk about some tools that do help in this aspect. So of course, the first one is ModSurfer. Now, ModSurfer is not really meant to be a tool for just directly debugging your WebSemi models, but it does give you enough information about your WASM models. And in fact, like uh, in one of their latest approach that um, they have kind of showcased, and I'd like to now quickly show a demo over here, is um, to basically head over to the main website. And I hope everyone's able to uh, see this over here. Uh, so essentially what this uh, particular new interface for ModSurfer is, and this is pre-released by the way, um, is that you can actually directly inspect your WASM modules to get to know about the import functions and the, you know, the imp imports and the exports and all the different functions that are being used. So you simply just have to go ahead and uh, upload a WASM uh, binary over here. So like, let's just take an example. And uh, we have prepared some demo of using uh, WASM Edge with uh, PyTorch. So we'll be using one of the modules that we have created. So of course, we should expect to see some WASENN uh, functions uh, that are being called over here or yeah. being invoked. Let's use this. So we'll just quickly go and choose one of the WASM Edge PyTorch WASM modules. Let's just go ahead and uh, select this and add it to our, in, to inspect this. And then we'll click on uh, upload wasm. No, it did not upload. Let's try one more time. Oh, that's weird. Okay, let's just choose. Oh, not this one. So we'll just take a couple of seconds, and then we should get a very good information about what's the complexity of the function uh, of this WASM module, what's the source code of the WASM module itself. It will actually also load a small JS code that can, you can actually just now go ahead and run in this in the browser itself. So if you want to just get some details with Dwarf, uh, you get some uh, start code that actually uh, you, know, you can directly load inside of your source code in, uh, in a JavaScript function. And then, of course, you get the entire list of your imports and exports, uh, which this particular WASM module is using. So you get information about uh, all of them. So, of course, uh, you'll also see WASI because this WASM module was generated by with a WASM Edge uh, uh, function that we created for uh, another conference. Um, and then, of course, uh, another like unique thing that's actually being done with Fermi on Spin. Uh, you must have probably heard about the AI serverless AI that's there. Uh, so the Dilipso team basically collaborated with uh, the Fermi on team to generate AI insights about the WASM module itself. And in fact, it can just tell you some additional details about, hey, like, what is the intended use of this particular WASM module? Uh, for, for example, in this case, uh, we were trying to generate this uh, PyTorch-based uh, function that would basically allow you to run PyTorch on the edge. So it also kind of gives you some insights about uh, how you could, uh, how potentially this particular WASM module might be used for embedded uh, programming. But uh, the unique thing about this particular tool is essentially this check file, right? So the idea over here is that um, with the help of this check file, and you could basically include this check file in your uh, GitHub action or any CI CD action that you could run. And uh, essentially what it's t telling us is that um, before you push your WASM module into production, you want to ensure that whether it matches the certain set of imports and exports that you want it to have, or if you want certain, uh, you know, for, for instance, like let's say, what is the size of the actual WASM binary that gets created? So if there are uh, instances where your WASM model does not meet those particular things, right? Whether it's missing certain imports or exports, uh, your CI will, will basically fail. And you'll, that'll prevent you from pushing your WASM model directly into production. So that's a really great way. And there's a quick demo that we want to kind of showcase. Um, so we'll head over to our VS Code right now, and I'll quickly go over to this particular directory over here. So we have basically gone ahead and just um, taken the same example, the same WASM module that we showcased. And the only thing that we have changed over here is that we, we expect the maximum size to be 2.5 megabytes. Now, if I try to just run the command, and again, this will be available on the mod surfer documentation, uh, I just need to run mod surfer validate. And then I will provide it the WASM uh, 
module that I'm trying to run and use the mod.yaml and once I execute this and I run this, it will tell me that we, on, in all, what all cases am I failing. So for example, um, one of the things that it failed on was the max size. Since, since we defined the max size to be 2.5 megabytes, but since the size of the model itself is nine, nine megabytes. So what you're seeing over here is that uh, even before you push your WebSimile module into production, uh, you can basically create these checks even uh, without having to worry too much about the actual model itself. And Ashwin, if you want to probably add something to uh, this particular tool. Uh, is that text side good for you all? You're gonna, at the back, you can read it, right? Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, so yeah, uh, we were able to work with the mod surfer team uh, to check out if we can if we can use this tool. Uh, the, th the, the the caveat here is uh, you do need to have mod server CLI uh, to check out you uh, use this check file here. Uh, but yeah, uh, we were able to get this done. So I'm so glad uh, we were facing a lot of bugs uh, quite quite recently before before our demo. Then moving on to the next tool, I know we are running out of time, but just to kind of talk about the Observe SDK. So Observe SDK is another tool that allows you to essentially add observability metrics. So once uh, you are like, let's say trying to find certain issues within the WASM module itself, um, we are uh, basically using Observe SDK and it can, you can directly then send your logs to any kind of a tracing tool like Jaeger uh, to uh, like, you know, uh, open telemetry. So in this case, like the example that now we'll basically show. Uh, and again, the point over here is that in this case, the SDK basically tracks all the functions and the memory allocations in the WebSimile module, right? Um, and so the idea really is that it's not just focusing on uh, the imports and the exports, but it'll also take a look at all the different function calls that are actually also happening, right? So the one of the drawbacks that we spoke about earlier about uh, instrumentation techniques not being able to know what's there inside the WASM module itself is what is overcome with the Observe SDK. And we have a quick demo to basically quickly showcase that. Yeah. So in this case, uh, what we have over here is this Observe demo, uh, and I'll just quickly uh, in yeah. zoom in this more. Uh, we have a main.rs file. This basically is a standard OTEL uh, to standard out output. Uh, so this uses the dialect so uh, SDK for observability, and we are simply just uh, again taking our was a module, taking it as an input, and trying to find uh, you know uh, any uh, issues that we are able to find. So over here we basically are taking a faulty Rust code. So this is a very simple Rust code that it does have an issue. So what I'll just go ahead and do is I'll navigate quickly over to my um, observe demo, and I'll quickly go ahead and run uh, cargo run. And essentially that what will allow, that will allow us to do is, uh, I'll just go, go ahead and do cargo run, and then uh, we'll run the instrumented was a module that basically gets generated from the observe SDK. So that will basically give you the trace, yeah. So new one, and then insta dot wasm. Insta, perfect. So what this will basically give you is, um, it gives you the call trace and the, the basically the stack trace, the actual error that is there in your WASM module. So this gives you directly that particular issue. So of course, um, now you could even go further. In this case, we had like, uh, you know, a non-executable WASM module, like, I mean, not intractable, but you could also make this intractable by accept, accepting certain JSON response so that you can get uh, to know about the issues or the errors in your WASM module on the fly, like as you're kind of interacting. Uh, another one, one final tool that's actually not launched yet, um, and of course, uh, Datadog actually just announced uh, their Observe SDK integration very, uh, very in the very past few days. Uh, but another toolkit that I'd like to point out is being done by the, uh, and actually I got to know about this yesterday itself at the Wasm Social by the, uh, you know, the by by the. Um, uh, by the loophole labs team is uh, the Wasm toolkit, which essentially uh, is the best of, of both the worlds when trying to use the Observe SDK because they are giving you information about um, not just like what's happening inside the Wasm module itself, but they provide a platform agnostic way or a language agnostic way. So you could essentially have your Wasm module being run in any kind of a web simulator runtime. And we saw that issue, like th there are so many different type of web simulator runtimes um, and all of them have these issues. So um, Essentially, I, again, I'll recommend you to keep in touch with the loophole labs because they are coming up with this and not, uh, you know, spend a lot of time because we are running out of time slightly. But I think, uh, and this is like one example for a deep, for a Golang code where we could see like all the standard, uh, you know, issues that are there and those are getting logged as well. 
And this is, I'll recommend everyone to kind of just take a screenshot because these are all the different approaches that we cover today. And the pros and the cons, uh, this is referred from a Shopify blog that is uh, shared. Um, but yeah, um, Ashwin, if you want to probably close. Yeah, a quick recap. Uh, this is a quick recap of what we just talked about. Uh, if you if the various strategies of debugging uh, WebAssembly, if you're using the native uh, print line method or whatever method that prefers, uh, yes, you are familiar with it, but then the problem is like, you cannot reproduce the behavior that you might be expecting while trying to debug WebAssembly in your in your application. Uh, Shiva explained about LLDBA and WASM time along with other runtimes. Uh, it's it has reasonable feature support, but it can be a bit difficult when variables are involved. Uh, same goes for WebAssembly specific debuggers. And uh, browser debugger is always convenient and have a familiar uh, experience, but comes at the cost. Thank you so much, and yeah, you can uh, scan the QR code to give any feedback about the session. Would love to connect with you on our Twitters. So thank you so much. Thank you so much.